welcome to Africa Unlimited with me, Adesemi Akinsanya. Over the next half hour, we're looking beyond the current turbulence and towards the bright spots on Africa's horizon, trends that could transform economies and improve lives across the continent. We'll find out how Africa could make much more from its raw materials. We'll meet retail entrepreneurs who have bounced back from the pandemic with innovation and a focus on luxury. And we'll see how Africa is protecting its natural resources to make development sustainable. Where some see uncertainty ahead, others see opportunity. In Africa, one such person is Aluko Dangote. He's the continent's richest person, and Arise News had exclusive access to him earlier in the year. We saw up close the vast scale of his plan to revolutionize the Nigerian oil industry. Hundreds of feet beneath Nigeria's surface <sighs> lies a natural resource that could transform the country's fortunes. Nigeria is sitting on 37 billion barrels of oil. Enough to power the country for 273 years. The oil itself has excellent qualities. It is low in sulfur, easy to blend, and relatively straightforward to drill. But the oil is both a blessing and a curse. In some countries, the discovery of oil has brought unprecedented wealth and development. In other countries, the discovery of oil leads to economic stagnation, inequality and corruption. It is sometimes called the paradox of plenty. And economists call it the resource curse. Just a decade after oil was discovered in 1957, it was a major factor tearing Nigeria apart in civil war. Since then, production has seldom exceeded 2 million barrels a day. Many economists blame the state-owned oil industry. These are state-owned refineries. And we know what the story of the refineries has been over the last 10 years. They have been underperforming grossly. They have been declaring losses and they have become a major liability. And oil money also fuels the corruption and unrest that has long plagued the country. The problem of oil theft by militant groups is endemic in Nigeria. By some estimates, 15% of all the crude produced in the country is stolen and sold on the black market. The Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, or NNPC, runs four refineries that operate at a fraction of their capacity. The newest is four decades old. It means that almost all of Nigeria's petrol, diesel and heat and fuel has to be imported, despite the country having the world's 10th largest reserves of oil. So the biggest producer of crude oil in Africa finds itself still stuck with imported fuel. Nigeria imports 90% of products like petrol and diesel, swapping its price export for petroleum products that people need in their everyday lives. That puts the Naira under pressure as it all has to be paid for in foreign currency. Everybody now is just thinking about oil, oil, oil. Whereas what we supposed to have done with this oil was to use this oil and now expand the economy. But one man is dreaming of a Nigeria where oil is a blessing to businesses and to people. This would be a Nigeria that is self-sufficient in fuel and he has got around $19 billion in financing backing him up. Next year, his new privately owned refinery is due to come online, producing 650,000 barrels a day. In theory, it could meet all of the country's fuel needs and have enough left over for exports. The 
The scale of this place is incredibly imposing, to say the very least. Photos do it absolutely no justice. You just have to see it in person. It's more like a very big city instead of just a project. I am Abby Owolawi for Arise News, and I am investigating how Nigeria's oil riches became a curse and finding out if they can be transformed into a blessing. Well, joining me from our Lagos studio is Arise correspondent Abisola Owolawi, as well as renowned energy economist Bismarck Rewane. Abisola, if I was to start with you, you have been to Dangote's refinery. Tell us what you've seen there and tell us how you think this refinery will transform Nigeria's oil industry. Right, Adefemi. Yes, uh, absolutely. The, the visit to the refinery and petrochemical complex was very, very eye-opening. It's a really audacious project. And uh, of course, in terms of how it will change the face, it, it's a myriad ways. Uh, we can talk about self-sufficiency, self-reliance, um, backward integration, import substitution, so many ways. Of course, self-sufficiency would, would mean that we can now meet the needs of Nigerians in terms of their um, demands for gasoline, oil, and, and what have you in terms of all the products, and also have enough for export. So the potential for that, one would imagine, is very immense. Thank you. Well, Bismarck, Mr. Rowane, you obviously are very privy to what's going on at the refinery. Do you think that the Dangote operations, well, first and foremost, it is believed that they, the, the Dangote operations are receiving a favorable deal from the government uh, in terms of the supply of crude oil or sales or the sale of refined products into the Nigerian market. Is this making financial sense? Yeah, it makes uh, financial sense. It makes strategic sense. And more than anything else, the whole concept of having a refining, refining and petrochemical hub, and I think that's how you have to describe it. Refi the refining process globally has now become, uh, has transitioned into the hub status. In other words, you have Singapore, Houston, um, Houston, Singapore, Rotterdam. Now Lagos is going to be the hub for refining for Central and West Africa. So the market is not just Nigeria, the market is West Africa. And therefore, Nigeria actually investing in this uh, project is also investing in export capacity, especially at a time that you have the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. So you have to look at it in the context of its strategic positioning, its future offering to the whole of West Africa, and more than anything else, how it helps to resolve part of the external imbalances of Nigeria at this point in time. Understood. Bismarck, we are definitely seeing what is a, a revolutionary project in this Dangote refinery. Do you think that this is con going to continue to be a game changer? Do you think we'll see other industries taking on this strategy of African raw materials being processed right inside Africa rather than being sent abroad? Yes, definitely. Um, the, the beauty of this is that the transportation costs of the crude oil to Europe and the transportation costs of refined products to the 54 African countries is exorbitant. Now, when you, when you have this process, it, it reduces the cost, it reduces the inflationary pressures in all of these African countries that depend on them, and also it enhances productivity. So you are having a three-dimensional positive impetus as far as the petrochemical refining and fertilizer, because it's a whole integrated process. So it is huge, and uh, it, first of all, the audacity of the proje project in the first place. The forward-looking, uh, the vision of those who conceptualized this 10 years ago and thought about it, and the courage actually to actually get financial close and get the, the completion on target is quite, it's, it's remarkable. I mean, the theory is one thing, but in practice, there's a lot of hope riding on this project. Do you believe that ordinary Africans are going to feel the economic effects, the benefits or all the negative sides of so much revolutionary change happening in Nigeria and across the continent? Yes, I say this because first and foremost, the infrastructure required to have a, refining, a refinery with, with a hub capacity 
First and foremost, the crude oil has to be piped all the way from Escravos and other places all the way to um, Ekwe. Then the finished products have to be, uh, refined products will have to be piped to different African countries. It has to be piped even to Nigeria rather than going to, initially you go to Atlas Cove, just the, the tankers leave Ekwe and go, go the other way. But I want you to think of the future, the depots, the pipelines, the, uh, and the other midstream activities that will lubricants and all the other things that are going to happen. So to look at it as a snap on a snapshot basis is to do injustice to the project. It is you have to sit back and look at everything that's going to happen, including the infrastructure, including the distribution, including the packaging, and even exports of this to other parts mm. apart from Africa, other parts of Europe. I think that is what you, it's, it's a game changing investment for all to all intents and purposes. Thank you very much, Bismarck. Stay with us as we'll be coming to you later on in the show. Well, coming up, the pandemic has not dented the luxury market. We meet the Nigerian retailers profiting from innovation. Plus, how do we make development sustainable? We see the big efforts to preserve small creatures. Well, welcome back to Africa Unlimited, a special show highlighting the broader trends driving growth across the continent. You'd think that the pandemic would have decimated the luxury sector in Nigeria, but in fact, business is booming, and that's thanks to a new generation of innovative retailers. The luxury goods sector has proven remarkably resilient through a global crisis, with analysts forecasting a near full return to 2019 revenues this year, as share prices continue to outperform the wider equity market. Yet, the crisis has changed the relationship between luxury brands and their consumers in significant ways. Yvonne Okocha is a luxury entrepreneur operating within the Nigerian market. Besides curating select pieces for purchase, Yvonne also offers personal shopping services for clientele with specific luxury choices. With the coronavirus um, pandemic and restricted travel, luxury sales plummeted drastically, but we also saw a sharp increase as soon as restrictions were lifted. While it is clear that the pandemic has deepened and solidified consumers' behaviours across sectors, it has also created new imperatives for the luxury industry, including the need to study a new shift in the psychology behind purchases. So in light of the last few months we've all experienced globally, what would you say are some of the factors currently influencing consumer decisions around luxury goods on this market? People are now becoming a lot more interested in their homes. We've seen a significant shift in that, uh, especially during the COVID lockdown. A lot of people had spent time in their houses. It gave them uh, a bit of time to think about, oh, how this is why I live every day. I want my space to be nicer. While many well-known luxury companies base their success on tradition and pedigree, an important factor in long-term growth is innovation and responsiveness to changing times as pop culture and social media have become driving forces behind changing demographics, consumption patterns and purchase habits of millennials, slowly eroding the unique positioning of vintage luxury. Regarding social media, the millennials are the highest users and they tend to go for luxury experiences and Instagrammable moments rather than purchasing tangible luxury goods. There is also a shift from material to experiential luxury in maturing markets, opening newer consumer segments for the travel and food industry. As relevance becomes the new legacy, luxury brands must lean in and transform themselves from brand-centric, controlled and confidential to transparent, engaging and customer-centric models to keep the golden coins rolling in. Abby Owolawi for Arise News. Well, Abisola is still in our Lagos studio with energy economist Bismarck Rewane. Abisola, if I start with you, Abby, it is important to say that the thriving luxury sector in Nigeria is not just being driven by the oil and gas industry, is it? 
of course, a lot of attention is basically always shown on the oil and gas sector. And we forget the d dynamism of the many other sectors around. You have telcos, you have the retail space, and of course, the influx in terms of the attention and more um, funding and growth of particular sectors will boost directly into retail, which is the largest space um, generally for um, raising revenue. Um, and that's one area that one could um, possibly look at. So the answer to that would be that no. Absolutely. And Bismarck, if I were to put this question to you about all of these technology unicorns, do you think they're going to provide the stable foundations for a truly diversified Nigerian economy? Yes, they will. And why do I say, I say this? I say this because one of the biggest bottlenecks to the Nigerian economic story is the, that of information asymmetry and the entrenchment of interests that create monopolies or oligopolies or state capture. The only way around this is to have information, homogene, homogeneous information across markets. The fintech space relies on digital transformation and digital activity and almost perfect information. So you can get information instantaneously for price discovery, for market efficiency, and that drives growth. So from a macroeconomic perspective, you need these things to actually unlock potential. The other question like I thought I heard you talking about is, does this create income inequality? Yes, it does create income inequality. So you have two models. You have the Indian model, where you had bang, bang, uh, Bangalore, where people are investing and you had higher income inequality. Or you have the Chinese model, where you use fintech to unlock productivity and take a lot of people out of poverty. I think Nigeria is likely to pursue the Chinese model, which means you will enjoy the productivity efficiencies that come from fintechs, but you also use the process of this to lift a lot of people out of poverty because poverty is really a big problem in Nigeria as well. You know, you, you've already touched on this, but I did want to ask you more pointedly, is, is, do you think there's a danger that the benefits from all of this technological success is going to be concentrated in the hands of the already highly educated elite and perhaps not trickle down to the everyday Nigerian? Yes, there's that risk. And uh, the truth is that you, Nigeria has an income inequality, what we call the Gini coefficient of around 43. Um, that is very high. It's one of the most unequal societies in the world. Uh, I think South Africa is higher. Therefore, if you, if, you, if you don't do something about income distribution and opportunity distribution, you can create a, a very highly stratified society which can actually lead to conflict. So that is an issue, and therefore the, the attempt to ameliorate this by fighting to take people out of poverty, it has to be not, not just in words, it has to be in deeds. Therefore, like I was saying earlier, the Chinese model unlocks productivity with technology, but also takes people out of poverty. The Indian model, which is highly okay. stratified, actually entren entrenches uh, inequality, and that you can see the difference between the two countries. Nigeria is likely to go with the Chinese model. Well, thank you very much, Bismarck. And of course, the other big challenge for Nigeria and the whole of Africa is to combine much needed economic development with sustainability. There are serious problems on all fronts, but there are also success stories. Through 2021, our environmental correspondent, Leila Johnson Salami, has been covering efforts to protect the environment, including this report about an endangered species. One million pangolins have been trafficked over the past 10 years. Every year, tens of thousands of pangolins are killed for their scales, which are used in traditional Chinese medicine, and also for their meat, which some see as a delicacy. For years, the poaching of pangolins was centered in Asia until pangolins became listed as critically endangered species and the illegal trade of pangolins between Africa and Asia began. I'm Leila Johnson Salami, and today we're going to be taking a look at closer efforts to save the pangolins in Nigeria. The first stop today is Greenfinger's Wildlife Conservation Initiative in Shongotedo, Lagos State. The organization has a sanctuary for pangolins and other wildlife animals. I've come to meet the founder, Chinedu Mugbo, to find out more about the poaching of pangolins. So here we do have quite a different number, about 50 different animal species here, um, which also includes the pangolins. Um, now, all these animals actually have been rescued from the um, wildlife trade, um, wet markets, 
um, wildlife markets, traditional markets, animals are used everywhere and these pangolins especially, you find them everywhere as food, as traditional medicine and sometimes even in the international wildlife um, trade. Nigerian animals are almost out if we, if we don't wake up to do something about it. So what we've actually discovered um, in time that is that this, these pangolins now have become very, very relevant for, for the international trade. We've been to the market, we saw the pangolin actually being scaled there, as in descaled, where they put them in boiling water and um, use a knife and just basically cut off their, um, the scales of them and they keep the scales for these um, international um, marketers. I just bought three pangolins to save them from the trade. We decided to take the pangolins to St. Mark's Animal Hospital for treatment, where Dr. Mark works around the clock to rescue and shelter animals. Hello. Lovely to meet you. Good How are you doing? Okay. How are you? What do we have? Oh, my goodness. We brought you some pangolins, pangolins that yeah? we um, rescued from the train I today. Wish. I recognize the sack because yeah. this is how they are transported. This is how they get to the bush meat, the wet market, and this is how they moved around. Now, this is very stressful for the animal. Apart from the limited air and all that, this is, they're it's not, not used to it. Yes, they're not used to it. And then it's a whole strange world. So the animal here now is already very stressed. Oh, yeah. when you receive them. So what we do is, when we get them, we evaluate their state of health. There are some that we would have to keep. The ones that we see that are in good body condition, alert and everything, we release almost immediately. But if they are not, we would have to take them in and rehabilitate them before we make our release. So I'm going to sedate him now and then take my parameters. Unfortunately, the three pangolins were quite traumatized and needed time to recover. However, Dr. Mark did have a pangolin who was fully treated and ready for rehabilitation in Lufasi Park, where he recently set up a pangolin rehabilitation center in collaboration with the park. We don't have data for what's going on in Nigeria. So we can't even tell that, okay, this is what is left. This is the rate at which it is going. But I can assure you the rate at which these animals have been removed from nature is alarming. We need to do something, we need to all come out and play our different roles to ensure that these animals don't go extinct in our time. What we're doing to nature, we're already seeing the reaction. 2020 was not a normal year at all, at all. We're already seeing nature reacting to humanity's brigandage against her acts of terrorism against her, wiping out species like the pangolin, pushing species into extinction. And the reality is there has to be a reaction. Unfortunately, we're not really seeing that reality. We're and not listening. <laughs> <laughs> we're not listening. Now, this center would also act as an educational center exactly. uh, for people, yes, for the government, yes, yes. for people, for visitors. Because people don't ask, what is a pangolin? Yes. A lot of Nigerians, I can boldly say, 95% of Nigerians do not know what a pangolin is. Exactly. So, the center is fulfilling the role of education, the role of rehabilitation. It's wonderful to have it here. African pangolins are at risk of becoming critically endangered species. And if the illegal trade isn't stopped, they will be poached to extinction. Luckily, efforts to save the pangolins do exist as we've seen today, but it's so hard to keep up with the trade on such a large scale. Well, we've got a little juvenile here today that's ready to be released back into nature. Hi, Dr. Mark. Hello. So we are going to do just that. Hey. <laughs> Leila Johnson Salami, Arise News, Lagos. Let's go back to Lagos, where energy economist Bismar Korewani joins us from the studio. Bismar, you would have seen uh, Leila Johnson Salami's package there. And I want to ask you about uh, what seems to be the benefit, a cost benefit analysis. If Nigeria truly uh, needs to develop in the way that people have been expecting it to in terms of it meeting its potential, will that not be at the sacrifice of a sustainable, uh, sustainable development in other areas? Is it possible to do both at the same time? Definitely, yes. 
And I tell you why. I, I tell you why. Because Nigeria today is the second highest uh, uh, deer forester in the world. In other words, Nigeria has been cu cutting down its forests more than any other country in the world except for one. Now that has stopped. Secondly, there are programs that are now, and I will use Edo State as an example, where if you have to have any agricultural project in Edo State, you have to assure the government that you are going to plant trees to create more forests because of one, the game reserves, two, the historical importance of this, and more than anything else, to meet the uh, environmental goals of the SDGs. So that is happening at the same time, but the quantum, the volume and the value of what is being done in terms of um, sustainability is not as rapid as what you're seeing in the industrialization. So what Nigeria has to do is to make a strategic and conscious decision, one, to continue to grow aggressively, but at the same time not to lose touch with the fact that the world is moving more towards uh, ecological and also uh, climate, um, uh, climate environmental, positive climate environmental projects at this time. It's important that we do that. We don't lose, uh, don't, don't lose touch with the reality, because that is the new reality. We are, we are going from brown foils to green foils. At the same time, we also are trying to you know, tear down the activity so that we don't pollute the, the environment like many others. Bismarck, thank you very much. You've been watching Africa Unlimited with me, Adifemi Akinsanya. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.